today rather than insisting on the demonstration of Evernote because really I reviewed what I have offered so far, what is to be uh, taught and demonstrated about Evernote and there isn't much, yes. If you take, if you click on the plus icon on the top left corner of a notes display in Evernote, you will find a variety of options, how to include inking or how to connect to Google Drive and upload a file from there inside Evernote. Some of those functions I have not demonstrated myself, I simply talked about them, but I think they're easy enough for you to just test on your own. Therefore, I'm going to use most of this class to catch up with my introduction, my explanation of the notes about the readings, in this case from the text, the second textbook, which is Briggs and Burke, Social History of the Media. I talked about the introduction and I will complete my overview of the main points, the points that you have to focus your attention on today. And I will hopefully complete the presentation of the second chapter about printing in its context. Okay, if there is time, by any chance at the end of this class, we will discuss Evernote, Notion, and possible options for the final project. If not, that discussion will happen on another day, but still between now and the end of the first part of the semester before the break. I want to call your attention on the instructions for the next digital assignment, which is also the next to last mm -hmm. assignment. There are two written assignments. You've done both of them. I've corrected both of them. There are three digital assignments. This is the second and there will be just one so that during the second part of the semester, you can actually focus on the completion of your project, which is not the kind of project you can do in three hours uh, or less the night of the deadline because it requires some thinking and initial preparation. For example, what kind of content do I want to include in my wiki? What kind of design I want to apply to the wiki itself and to the pages? What advanced features I want to include and how can I showcase those features to make my presentation as strong as possible? So, in reference to the second digital assignment, the one on Evernote, which is due next week. However, I do know that many of you may have midterms between the end of this week and throughout next week. If you need more time for the assignment, just let me know before the deadline, explain why you need it and when. Don't, don't ask for an open-ended extension. Tell me I'll be done by this date. Uh, is, is that okay, etc. In reference to that, I have created, as promised, a page that you find included inside the instructions for this assignment, which is found under week six. Either the computer or the mouse are malfunctioning, a bit slow. Inside this page, I have been placing the titles of the videos that were selected for the assignment. There are about 10 or 12 right now. They're sorted by the first word on the title, so even when the first word is the, you will find them there. This way, if you're still thinking, if you're still trying to find a video, you will know today, tomorrow, whenever you want to consult this, this will be updated in real time. You will find which videos were picked already. And for everyone, I've included the title, the name of the YouTube channel, 
the link to the YouTube videos in case you want to have an idea of what other people have chosen to be inspired by their example and the first name and initial of the student who picked that. My plan is later on, when I receive the shareable links from the students, to also include the short summary that is a required section inside the Evernote page of your assignment. Okay? So that this page can indeed be the map to a small wiki where if you're looking for certain keywords, certain functions, you will find through a simple search which videos, which Evernote pages talk about that particular aspect of Evernote. So don't wait too long before you select your video because again, if you wait until the night of the deadline, I might not be able to respond in time and tell you, yes, go ahead with this particular video. So even if you're not planning to work on it until later next week, do choose a video as soon as possible so that the first initial step is done and then you can proceed whenever you want at your own pace at, in, in your own time, okay? I said, yeah, there are 12 in here. And as soon as I receive an email, if I'm not in a meeting or in a class, I respond saying, yes, you can proceed. And, and I add the title, I add the link to the list, or I'll tell you uh, it was already taken. But before you send me anything, check on this page. The next thing I want to call your attention on is a vital detail when you're done with your page, what you have to do is send me via email a shareable link to that page. That is to say, there are two ways to share an Evernote page, like you saw with Notion. In the case of Notion, the preferred option for me was to be invited to the Notion page so that I could leave comments, etc. In this case, because of the way sharing works in Evernote, I'm asking you not to use my email, not to invite me, not to share the notebook or page with me, but to create a link that will be shareable, meaning that everyone will be able to read your page. And that's the idea. It's a small wiki. So the idea is that if everyone has the curiosity, they can click on the link, see your page, see what you've written. Okay, so keep that in mind and of course, it's about Evernote, so I, I don't expect you to include private information in there, right? It's about videos in uh, and the Evernote experience. So use this format for sharing. If you need any help, of course, you can refer to the help uh, and tutorial uh, pages of Evernote and being Evernote with such a large base, you can also find plenty of videos on YouTube about sharing and otherwise, you can contact me if you need help with that particular stage. And again, keep in mind, these are the sections that are required in your page, starting with the summary. Now you know the reason why the summary should be short, okay? A few lines, uh, because I want to include it in our page together, of course, I will add to that page also the link to your Evernote page. So it'll be placed on a page that all students can visit, but technically it's, it's an open public page. Okay, so if you have any questions, you need any assistance with this, let me know. These are the notes, this is the page that I used on Monday to introduce the main points in the first chapter from the second textbook, The Social History of the Media. And I've added, as I said, notes about the second chapter as I previously announced. And, and it's not. Compared to the other um, notes, I, I had to, for the other textbook, <coughs> include more words in this case, 
I've just limited myself to, to a skeletal outline that I will discuss in class, and that gives you an idea of the kind of things you have to know, learn from this book in order to be prepared for the exam. Of course, at some point, right after the, uh, the, the spring break, probably, I will produce sample questions and discuss the format of the exam, a description of which is also found in the syllabus. So we discussed the media last time and communication. And the last thing we were discussing is how everyone is willing to accept as a fact that modern media of different kinds especially TV and digital media, have a lot of influence on their viewers or uh, visitors, if you're talking about websites and such. It's less of a given that the same kind of communicative strategies that produce that kind of influence were already tried and tested successfully in previous genres, in previous formats of communication. So if you look at the scholarship in the field of media and communication, and partly in the field of literature and theater, you find that you can trace a line and see the commonalities between TV serials of today and going back to the TV series of the 1950s, to radio serials, and from there to novels from the 19th century that were printed in magazines. And keep in mind that the 19th century has two kinds of novels. One is the big novel, which is typical of that century, big and structured like a classical symphony, big and complex with a large number of characters, with often plenty of re re historical references or historical events included in the narrative, the kind of books that were meant to be the foundation for a national identity, who were provided, uh, were trying to provide the reader with a kind of secular Bible, right? With all the values that a good citizen in society should have and France and England provide the best example of that with Honoré, with Balzac, with Zola, uh, Flaubert to, to an extent, but even Italy with Alessandro Manzoni has other egregious examples. When we're talking about the same line along which you find the TV series, that's not the kind of novel I'm talking about. I'm talking about the entertainment novel, which really has the same tropes that you will find in TV series, soap operas, dramas, uh, etc., betrayal, uh, disappearance and reappearance of characters, the cliffhanger, so suspending narrative in a critical, crucial moment to abandon that line of narrative with that character to move to another character and leave that uh, suspended. The idea, for example, that the beginning of the novel will always be intricate, but the conclusion will be much simpler and will not really reconcile all the threads, will not bring all the threads to a satisfactory conclusion, right? The, the first season is always the best and, and the final episode is always the one that leaves more people dissatisfied, right? Things of that nature. However, it's not limited the connection to, from TV series, to the novels, popular novels of the 19th century, you can go back in time and find that media played a big social role and you've seen the definition of media that I quoted from the textbook. I, I, I tried to offer my own version of that during Monday's class to me. A medium is not a medium unless you find both communication and influence, right? Uh, if, if it is just something that communicates without intentional, intentionally or unintentionally influencing the user, 
that it's not exactly a medium. According to those principles, even if you go back in time, you find other examples of visual media. And the best examples you can find are the cycles of frescoes that you would have found in every or any medieval church in Western Europe, some of which had vanished, right? Sometimes you go to Italy or France or Spain and you find that the walls of the churches are just stone, right? Uh, no plaster, uh, sometimes just bare stone. However, even in those instances, oftentimes there were frescoes that deteriorated so much that at some point they were removed. But originally the walls of most churches were covered in frescoes and those frescoes were media, mediums or media, the vehicles to a religious and social ideology. So for example, when you go to Assisi and you find the frescoes which are probably by uh, Giotto, although we don't know for sure because we don't have documents documenting that he was there, that he was being paid, uh, etc. So there are alternative painters that might have worked on this. The entire church of the main church, because there are three levels if you go to Assisi, but the, 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 the church on top of the others, the superior level, is full of frescoes documenting the life of San, Fran San Francis of Assisi, but each one of them is imbued with the ideology of the time, social, political, and religious ideology. First of all, keep in mind that St. Francis could have easily turned into a heretic, into someone that proposed a risky interpretation of the Bible, of the Gospels, who was very critical of the corruption of the church and was really uh, on, on the edge, uh, right on the line in between being absorbed by the church as it happened, being normalized, his message being normalized, and being instead condemned as a heretic and, and perhaps ending either in prison or at the stake with a pile of burning wood uh, under his feet. Keep in mind that St. Francis did not give his movement, his group of brothers, of friars, an institutional organization and a set of rules until the last part of his life. He resisted that kind of normalization. He found the institutionalization of the Franciscan order to be intrinsically dangerous for the purity of their message. And in fact, the, 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 the controversy is so clear that right after he died in the 1220s, the order split into two separate orders because there was an ongoing debate about the interpretation of the original Franciscan rule. In this case, what you see, apparently you just see Francis in his previous life. Francis was the son of a merchant. The name Francesco was given to him. It was a new name for Italy at the time because his father went to France, Francia, to do business. And in his previous life, Francis is a rich man of Assisi traveling with a horse, with expensive uh, uh, robes uh, and clothes on him, but feeling already the inspiration of the gospel uh, in him, you find in this episode that he stops uh, while he's traveling back to his town and gives his cloak to a poor man in here. So apparently you see an act of charity. Apparently you see someone who, even before his official conversion, felt inspired by the message of the gospel to give of his own material riches to the poor. In fact, there is an ideological message that is pretty clear and that is conveyed by the visual elements in the painting itself, right? You see how the diagonals created by the hills in the background converge on the halo and the sanctity and the centrality of St. Francis, St. Francis is clearly uh, uh, central to this. And on one side you see the horse with the elegant saddle, on the other side you see 
the poor, and those are the two choices that Francis had in front of him. Continue to live the rich life afforded to him by his family, follow in his father's footsteps, or embrace poverty. And right now, as I said, it's before the official conversion, so he's in between. He's placed in between these two choices. He's transitioning, right? And that is still part of the religious elements. However, look more in the background, because the background is not neutral. It's occupied in a conspicuous way by architectural elements. And what is that you find? On one side, you find the city of Assisi, right? And you see that this is uh, much more, much bigger and uh, more developed than this uh, construction on the left. So the two sides by anyone who lived in that area could be easily interpreted as the main town, which at that point was a city-state. So a place with their own center of government, their own laws, controlling the surrounding countryside and the countryside itself. And therefore this painting is also about the political dynamics between the town and the surrounding territory. Because city-states were places where merchants held po positions of power and prospered with their manufactured products, with their import-export kind of business, with their investments, at the expense of the countryside. Because one of the things that merchants in power in the city needed for their business to prosper was to keep wages low. How do you keep wages low? You need to have products that in, make the, the uh, ensure the survival of their laborers maintain a low prices. So they make sure made sure that the peasants would sell the products, the, the agricultural products, to the city at lower prices. So the town prospered, the countryside was depressed. So you also have in the back this reference to the political dynamics. And of course, San Francis comes from the city and San Francis represents the fact that the city is unfair in some ways, right? Price of products is, is kept low artificially, but it's also generous in other ways. So the, the town is also making up for their unfair business practices because the town itself is expresses, is expressing someone like San Francis, who is generously donating to the poor. And then the secondary message is, well, what are you complaining about? Poverty is what the best among us are embracing. So don't complain that you're poor because the town is making you poor because you go to paradise, you go to heaven, right? So in a way, you're lucky to have that condition because luxury is sinful by itself, etc. So once you unpack this, you find a multiplicity of layers and a complexity of message that makes this a medium, communication and influence, right? And this is just one in a series of more than 20 episodes. You can imagine how not only regular visitors to the church would stop and contemplate these frescoes. And keep in mind that churches in the Middle Ages are not religious places, they're social places, they're public places. That is to say, nowadays, who goes into a church? People who go to Mass on Saturday or Sunday, the other very few people who go to Mass every day, and tourists. During that time, people would go inside a church the same way you go into a cafe. That is to say, they would go there to see who was there, they would stop and talk to each other. We have anecdotal evidence that people were just going there the same way that you would go to any public place to uh, interact socially with others, not just doing religious business. Then you have to imagine the priests during their homilies referring to these episodes, calling these episodes to the attention of the faithful in the church and saying, you see, do you remember what St. Francis did, etc. And this entire fresco is about the normalization of St. Francis, who was really uh, anarchy for, for the church, anathema for the church of the time. Think of the other popular image and idea associated with St. Francis. St. Francis who preaches to the birds, preaches to the animals, right? And St. Francis to this day becomes one of the patron saints of ecology. 
Nothing like that if you, if you read in the lives of the friars who, uh, after St. Francis' death, wrote his biographies. St. Francis goes to a town to preach. Nobody listens to him. And he, gets, he goes into a rage. It's like Jesus with the merchants of the temple. Goes into a rage and says, you're not listening to me. I'd rather deliver my message to the animals because they're brutes, but they're better than you. You are worse than them because you're not listening to me. So it's not St. Francis loving nature, loving animals. It's St. Francis being very angry at humans. But the message gets reversed and normalized, right? So that it is more acceptable that you don't take, you don't run the risk of having people doing what St. Francis did, give away the goods, the material riches of his family to the poor. And in general, the art of the past is didactic, meaning that it's teaching things, or if you will, really is influencing the viewers because it's not open, direct teaching, it's indirect. But the past is made of multiple channels of communication. So even the, the society of the past relied on a variety of social public rituals. That is to say there were all kinds of events, social events that were meant to educate, to communicate and influence, communicate about certain values and practices that needed to be imitated and communicate about them, educate people about them. So a lot of religious rituals not just confined to the church, but also in other public places, right? Processions, rituals that happened outside of the church. Mm -hmm. Justice, think of the public executions. Public executions were a regular thing in uh, so many countries in the past. And they were well attended by people. So those become media in a way. They communicate and they influence or educate. And political rituals, right? The investiture of a leader, the crowning of a king, the marriage of a king. These public rituals lasted into 1900s, really. And then nowadays they're being replaced by other kinds of rituals, the rituals of sport, of entertainment, of music, etc. For the most part, we still have some religious and political rituals. Theater was also something that was not confined to the theaters, but sometimes performed in public arenas in public places and therefore theater became such a medium of influence and communication that way. The power of the media of the past is evident through the criticism that was directed at those media. Criticism that was based on the assumption, the working assumption that the influence of these media, whether it be the arts, theater, social rituals, etc., or literature, the influence was so powerful, the effects could be so manipulative that you needed to warn the users. You needed to tell them to stay away, right? And, and you find recurring invitations to not read certain texts by religious institutions, or in the second chapter about the print, you find that even after the print, the printing press, the printing industry was so successful in Western Europe, some countries, for example, Turkey, kept having laws against printed books and warned citizens from reading too much. So you know that we're talking about media because of the reactions that are produced by their success. And of course, every media implies the idea that through a media you can create a monopoly of knowledge, right? If you are the institution, the ecclesiastic institution paying Giotto for the frescoes in Assisi, you know what kind of message you want from them, right? And the same is true of other painters, of Michelangelo, or Caravaggio, they had their own ideas about religion, but you only see them somewhat hidden in their works because there was an official message that they were paid to communicate through their art. And 
there is a dynamic that gets repeated through the periods, through the historical ages. The creation, the institution of a monopoly of knowledge, right? Go back to Egypt and the religious caste and, and their control of knowledge, their control of the language, their control of official history, which gets repeated in Roman society, where the first historians were members of the elites and often members of the religious orders. But then the other side of this repeated phenomenon is that you go from trying to establish and reinforce a monopoly of knowledge to the next kind of medium which brings entropy, which takes away from the order, the structure of the monopoly of knowledge to introduce multiple elements to disseminate the control of knowledge, not just the content, but the control, the production of knowledge itself. So every new medium introduces an element of entropy, and this is true from Egypt to this day, right? From having a few people being able to read or produce something that could be read to the social media, the digital technologies that allow anyone to be part of the medium and to be the vehicle of dissemination of different kinds of content, right? So when you go from the hieroglyphs to the alphabets, these instruments are become available to a larger number of people. Still limited, right? But certainly a larger number of people. When you go from the orality of poems, such as the poems assigned to Homer in Greece, the Iliad and the Odyssey, we don't know much about Homer and probably two poets, not one who wrote the two poems. Or you go from the Socratic schools of philosophy in Greece where the teacher, the philosopher, would simply talk to their disciples, not have anything in writing, to schools where you have documents and notes, to scribes who produce, multiply the number of manuscripts, and then you go to the printed books, you have this dispersion of knowledge. That knowledge does not originate from one center, but from multiple centers, and knowledge in the hands of single individuals can be farther disseminating, so even the individuals can become the center of control of knowledge in certain situations, right? And this kind of idea of entropy, I think it's visually best exemplified by the comparison between a fresco that is surely by John, to this time there are no doubts on the attribution. This is the beautiful Cappella degli Scrovegni in Padova, a city in, in, north east, in, in the Italian northeast. And this is the final judgment, right? Judgment day, the end of times, when Jesus comes back to judge the living and the dead. And he sends some to eternal damnation, others to eternal life, right? And together with them, you have the angels, you have the apostles, the saints, all the elements of the creed are in here. But what is visually very evident is the order of this. This is Judgment Day, should be a chaotic event, but everything proceeds in good order. You have the courts of the angels on both sides, with some with, with trumpets, those are the heavens. You have Jesus sitting on a throne to judge and to dominate. You have the apostles and the founders of the church and the saints next to him. And then you have those who were saved on one side, saved, of course, by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and those who were damned on the other side, including Satan himself chewing on the worst sinners because these are material punishment. But everything is clear and organized, right? That's the message. And just two centuries later, the same event is portrayed in this fresco by Michelangelo, which is gigantic, right? Compared to the Cappella di Scrovegni, this is four times as big. And what is the first impression? Chaos, right? It is a chaotic event that 
is the vehicle for a much more complex kind of content, a much more complex view of what faith is about, what salvation and damnation are about. And this time, there is no clear organization, the saints, the apostles, the groups, etc. But it's all together because there is an understanding that it's not black and white, that it's not hell and heaven, that is a much more complex dynamics. Where is Jesus? Yes, I can see it is central, but, and, and he has the Virgin Mary by his side, but he's surrounded in a chaotic way by groups who are part of a dynamic process, right? The other fresco communicated the idea that everyone has its place, right? And there is order within each uh, individual's life. In here, you see complex social interactions at work, forces that support and forces that oppose one's path to uh, salvation. So just to tell you how much even these visual media of the past could communicate and how different the ideas in reference to the same event could be, right? And talking about this idea that criticism tells you about the power of the media, just think of all the controversy, all the talking about digital detox in our lives, right? All over the world, it's a global phenomenon, right? Come to a retreat uh, where you surrender your digital media and you spend two days or two weeks uh, without uh, a, a smartphone, without a tablet, without the internet, etc. And regardless of what you think about these attempts to curtail our use of the media, what is telling is that we see those medias, we consider them to be so influential that we see them as potentially so dangerous that we need to talk about detox. But once again, this is what we have in front of us, but we have kind of forgotten all the controversies from the past. Because even in the past, from the Middle Ages, or earlier, but especially from the Middle Ages to the age of the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, you find plenty of intellectuals, books, that are preaching against the media of the time, who are saying, be careful, be aware of the nefarious effects that these arts can have on your soul, on your mind. For example, the idea that you go see a, a sculpture and uh, uh, you can be sexually aroused. You can be uh, influenced by the realism of a sculpture. Keep in mind the sculptures in the past, following the practice of the Romans used to have, might have colors uh, even. Now we associate sculpture with white marble, but it wasn't meant to be like that. Most sculptures from the Greek or Roman area had some color on them. They had painted eyes, uh, etc. So we have people who go see a sculpture and are moved by it in many ways. Their piety may be stimulated or their impure thoughts may be stimulated, right? So we don't as as assign that kind of power now to those media, but they used to have the kind of power we assign to our media, okay? So it, you see that it's not historical evolution. There are trends in society that uh, are associated with different kinds of me media. Same with music. The idea that music uh, can be the work of the devil, that is so powerful on the soul that you have to be careful. And during the Middle Ages, in some areas, you have the idea translated into social rules that music could only be allowed for religious ceremonies. Only religious music is pure. Any other kind of secular music is impure and leading to your damnation. Same with the romances then, uh, historical uh, and novels and uh, chivalric novels and poems. The idea that you read them and you're transported into a, a world that is unreal, that, it, that has no connection with real world and that is full of values that are dangerous because characters behave in those fictional worlds in ways that don't match the limited amount of freedom that you have in real life. And, th and this goes from the end of the Middle Ages to th the age of Romanticism and the 19th century. For example, in the 19th century, you have the typical, stereotypical example of the naive female reader who grows up reading romances 
and who conceives of love in a way that is dangerous for the practicality of marriage. So this woman goes from imagining what romantic love and passion should be and then finding herself in an arranged marriage sanctioned by society and subject to rules that do not reflect the romantic values she has absorbed from the readings and from this contrast between what she imagined marriage to be and what marriage is, you have social tensions and without marriage, society will fall, etc., etc. This idea that our irrational impulses are stimulated by media is not limited to social media, the internet, etc. Even if you go back to the first formats of journaling, the, of, of journals, of, of the press, the gazettes, the gazetteers were famous for stimulating uh, the interest of the readers by uh, including gory details or by including, uh, there was a whole genre of articles about freaks, uh, ab about deformed babies that were born or Siamese twins, especially imperfect Siamese twins being portrayed as monsters, about natural phenomena, earthquake, asteroids hitting the earth, being represented in dramatic fashion as signs of the apocalypse, signs of the end of time. Okay, so even the media of the past wrote the theme of influence in a grand, in, in grandest way. And Grand Guignol is, is the point, uh, the culmination before our current media in Paris at the end, at the turn of the century between the 19th and the 20th century, André Delors, and similar authors, but particularly André Delors, he built an entire theater, a small theater, he bought and, and uh, uh, modified this small theater in Paris to show just a particular kind of horror plays where torture happened on the stage. And of course they had all sorts of tricks, mechanical tricks to represent dismemberment, to represent hangings, etc. So, and, and you have there some of the tropes that you find in modern horror movies, the mad scientist, the mad doctor performing experiments on their patients, the crazy killer, the serial killer, uh, etc. Okay, and this kind of tense situation, one of the André de Lourdes uh, um, play is about a driver, and this is the beginning of the automobile as a technology, the driver who is driving someone, a passenger in the back, this passenger is a murderer, and this becomes apparent during the story, so what will happen? Because they're in the car, they're traveling, they're in this confined space, so what will happen? Will the driver escape uh, the, the, the attempts of the murderer, etc. Okay, so parallel words is the constant theme of the criticism, right? This is not the world. You are escaping into the internet. You are spending your time in the basement or on the screen. You are not with us. You are not uh, uh, present to your community, etc. It's nothing new. This kind of criticism, in one way or the other, was found in previous uh, periods. And why do we believe in this? Because for the last 250 years, we've believed mostly after the fall of the religious cultures, right? After religiosity became secondary to uh, the life of every individual or almost every individual in the community, we fall prey to the myth of progress and modernization. This idea that, or oh, we are in 2022. How can we have this in our society in the year 2022? Well, they had it in the year 1022 or in the year 222. But the idea is that every year should bring progress to society. Every generation should be better than the others, more educated, more illuminated. Unfortunately, I don't think it's like that. Cipolla is, is a great Italian scholar, uh, um, scholar of the history of the economy. Uh, and he wrote about the effects of this myth, of this idea that our time is better than what society was a thousand years ago. And in some ways it might be, but there isn't a constant progress, right? That, that's a modern way of thinking. Or think about the contradictions, for example, 
what you hear, right? The stereotypes of conversations, traditional societies and articles. Traditional societies are defunct, right? The past has been destroyed by modern civilization. Is, is it really so? And look, exactly the internet has become a repository of stories, materials, documents for traditional societies in a way that never was allowed by previous media, right? Traditional societies were part of a process, even in the past, traditions were revised, destroyed, remade, changed. And if anything, it's now the internet that has become the archive of the past and that past, those traditions are to be found there more easily than in any other kinds of context in the past. You find here the classical formula of communication by Laswell, one of the pioneers in this field. I leave that to your reading. I pretty much reported what the book has. I just want to say, I just want to add that this is important because everything else was just historical. In this case, some of these principles, some of these questions are questions also that can be useful to you when you uh, complete your digital project because these questions are legitimate, relevant questions even for you when you realize a wiki that is potentially open to a visitor that communicates about contents, etc. So keep this in mind. It's not just theory. It is something that is applicable. And that is the last section for the first chapter the expansion of media. Modern media are more expansive. And that is very true. Modern media are different in a significant way. What is that way? The media of the past had a clear primary function and some secondary functions. Some explicit functions and some implied or implicit functions. Modern media are different in that the apparent primary function is not really what it seems to be. That is to say, take smartphones. Are smartphones really being used as an instrument of communication over a distance? Clearly not, right? You may have a smartphone and never talk to someone on the phone, right? Kids, don't, children don't talk to their parents on the phone, don't even answer their, the phone. They send messages to their parents, they don't talk to them. I, I can prove that. And you can use a smartphone to communicate to someone in another room. You can use a smartphone when you are next to someone and you're not talking to the person next to you or you're never talking to the person when they're next to you. You're always, you're communicating with your friends more when they're not there than when they're near you. Clearly, the primary functions of the phone are different from using it as a phone, right? It's a completely different kind of devices. Take other kinds of so-called individual technologies. By individual, I mean symbiotic technologies. Technologies that have become an extension of the self such that you wouldn't live without them. The first such technology was the automobile. And again, you go back to the documents about the automobile from the 1890s and 1900s, what would you expect to find? You would expect to find someone who says, we have a wonderful means of transportation, which is good to transport people and goods over long distances in a quick and expeditious way. Not at all. You don't find that claim. What you find over and over again in those documents is, we have an exciting technology. We have someone that gives you speed. And speed is a dimension that didn't exist before. Yes, we had trains, but trains did not give you the sense of speed because you were enclosed in, in, in the cars, in the train cars. We had ships, but ships only gave you some sensation of speed. The car will give you speed. So the car is not, believe it or not, about transportation when it comes out and everyone says, we're perfectly fine with horses and carriages, with steamships, with trains. We don't need to improve on that. That is perfectly satisfying or satisfactory. But 
the automobile is being sold as a product that gives you a feeling, that gives you a sensation that you wouldn't otherwise be able to prove. So it's not the extension of the legs, the automobile, in a McLuhan kind of fashion. McLuhan always tried to study media and technologies as an extension of the body. The automobile is not seen as or represented as an extension of the legs. It is an extension of the belly, of the nervous system, not of the, of the mind. It gets to you through your body. It gives you sensations you cannot control, the sensation of speed. And, and that's the sign that technologies have shifted culturally and socially into a never before seen dimension. Because it's not so clear the connection between the apparent purported primary function of the technology and their actual use and the way they change those technologies change uh, life for their users and this is, is the beginning of the chapter on print and I'll go through it uh, this some of it quickly you know that printing is, is not a European invention that long before it was introduced in Europe it, it did exist in uh, Asia in the form of block printing, but it never developed into a full-fledged industry. It was also not serving the needs of a language that relied not on a limited alphabet, but on an extensive range of ideograms. And therefore, when it was introduced in Europe by John, Johann Gutenberg, the book says around 1450, I, I take the side of those who predate the invention of the printing press to the 1430s or 40s at the most, but we, we don't have much evidence. It is reintroduced uh, by, by Gutenberg, and right away you have a diaspora of experts. German printers learn, are apprentices, become apprentices in, in a printer shop and then once they become expert, they travel south to Italy or to France, to Eastern Europe, where their skills are very much in demand. And they bring with them on donkeys, on the back of donkeys, the instrument, right? Some kind of primitive press to start their business. And right away, we're talking about 50 or 60 years, right away you have 250 places in Europe where we know there were presses, places meaning towns, villages, convents, and 80 of those places, about a third, were in Italy. Italy was really the center of the printing press. By, by the year 1500, 60 years later, Venice alone, just Venice, had already printed about two million books. And we have enough documents. These are not wide estimates. Uh, these are, are good approximations to reality. By 1500, 27,000 titles had been printed all over Europe. And the average run was between 300 and 500, with very few uh, uh, print, printing presses printing uh, less than, fewer than 300, and rarely more than 500 on rare occasion to 1,000. They would rather reprint again based on demand. But if you calculate these numbers, you get between 10 and 20 million books in 50 or 60 years. That's the incredible revolution that happens, and that generates a print industry, which is also the first modern industry. Because the first serial product, because all artisanal products are not serial, right? If you have a thousand nails made by blacksmiths in the Middle Ages, every one is slightly different from the other, right? Because they're all made by hand. But for a book, they're almost identical. Even books have differences, especially during this time, but they're almost identical. The first serial product and therefore the first industrial product of Western culture is the book. I'll stop here and I'll continue on Friday.